Hello, welcome. We're going to show you some good things to look for in the night sky. Now, we're using Stellarium as viewed from Meadville, Pennsylvania on planet Earth. Now, Meadville has a latitude of about 42 degrees. If you're anywhere close to that latitude, you'll see similar things in your sky as well. Uh, and it won't be that different even if you're in other portions of the northern hemisphere. Now, right now, the sun is up high in the sky. It's the current time, April 16th in 2020, three uh, hours after noon, and so three hours and seven minutes uh, in the p.m., in the post-meridian. And there's the sun towards the southwest, and as time goes on, we'll see that it goes down, of course, closer and closer and closer to the horizon. Now, the sun is going to set just a little northward of west, and that's because we are in springtime now. It sets exactly to the west on the first day of spring. And with each day that uh, progresses in spring, the sun sets more and more northward of west, reaching the furthest north of west on the first day of summer, and then it starts to come back down again. It will set to the west on the first day of fall, the autumnal equinox, and then it will keep going southward until... Uh, on the first day of winter, it'll set the furthest south of west that it sets before it starts coming up towards the north again, setting to the west on the first day of spring. So this is about 9.07 p.m., 9.08 p.m., what the sky would look like. Um, notice that we can still see the constellations of the winter hexagon. Even though it's now springtime, we get a little glimpse of them as long as we can see the western horizon. So this is what you can look for. This year in 2020, Venus will be in the Taurus the Bull constellation. Here's what the bull looks like with a little bit of artwork. Um, there's the horns of the bull. There's Aldebaran, the eye of the bull. It'll have this red color. It's a red giant star in the Hyades star cluster. You see this V-shaped pattern of stars? That's what you'll want to look for, for the face of the bull. And then in the back of the bull, you see the seven sisters. That's also known as the Pleiades. And we could zoom in on it. It's beautiful to look at with binoculars if you own a pair. And you'll see hundreds of stars there packed together in this open cluster of stars. Under a telescope, um, you'll see, and even with binoculars, you'll see that it has this fuzziness. It's a nebula. This nebula is the gas out of which those stars formed, and now the stars are shining into that nebula and are illuminating it. The blue light scatters more than other colors of the rainbow, which is why this nebula has this bluish hue associated with it. It's a reflection nebula embedded there in the Pleiades star cluster. Now, the Pleiades is a little more than 400 light years away from us. So what that means is that when you see light coming from those stars, that light's been traveling for the last 400 years to reach you here on planet Earth. The Hyades star cluster is a bit closer. It's around 150 light years away. And uh, these two star clusters, the Pleiades and the Hyades, they're very similar to one another. The big difference is their distance. And because the Pleiades is uh, two or three times further away, it is two or three times smaller um, in each direction on the sky. So, yeah, there's Taurus the Bull, and Aldebaran is going to be one of the vertices of the winter hexagon. That's something that you can look for in the winter. I'll trace out the hexagon for you, starting with Aldebaran. One side, two, three, four, five, six. Six sides, that's a hexagon. Now, down towards the horizon here, between the southwest and the west, we have Rigel. That is in the foot of Orion the Hunter. There you can see Betelgeuse in the shoulder of Orion, the belt of Orion. And if you zoom in on this region right below the belt, that is the Messier object number 42. That is the Orion Nebula. It's a star-forming region. It's about 1,500 light years away from us with a lot of newly formed stars in that vicinity. In fact, that M42 is part of a larger giant molecular cloud complex that extends throughout a large portion of the um, Orion constellation. 
So um, there you go. Orion the Hunter, you can think of him as holding on to a shield, defending himself from Taurus the Bull. And maybe here's his arm coming up this way, holding on to a club. But this is the shoulder of Orion, the other shoulder, his belt, and his two feet down here. Now, Orion's trusty helper is the big dog, Canis Major. A little bit to the left, that is, to the east here. Um, or more south here than um, Orion. And the big dog has the brightest star in the night sky, Sirius. Here's the head of the dog right there. There's the front leg of the dog. There's the body of the dog, the back leg of the dog. Here's the tail of the dog. That's the big dog, Canis Major. Now, uh, Rigel and Aldebaran and Sirius, they're the bottom portion of that winter hexagon. Let's start to look higher in the sky so we can see the top portion as well. Working our way around, we next have Procyon. Procyon is, is, Procyon is not in the big dog, it is in the little dog. And unless you have really dark skies, you'll probably only see Procyon. You might see that second star as well. Um, now, Procyon, part of the little dog, is near Pollux the next vertex of the winter hexagon. And truth be told, I usually think about Pollux and its partner star, Castor, as being the vertex together. They share one corner of the winter hexagon. Now, Pollux and Castor are the names of those stars. They're also the names of the twins that, the, that, that they are within. The constellation they are within is, do you know? It's Gemini the Twins. And Gemini is actually a constellation that is a sign of the zodiac, a zodiacal constellation. Of course, we don't believe in astrology. It has no predictive power, etc. But the traditional signs of the zodiac that some uh, of you know, just for fun, I hope, as entertainment from, um, from astrology, are the constellations that the sun passes in front of over the course of the year. Now, the ecliptic is what I'm showing you here, this line that's going across the sky. As the Earth orbits around the sun, it, it, the sun, will be in front of a different set of background stars. And so in, um, let's see, in the fifth month of the year, May, the sun will be in front of Taurus the bull. And then as we get into June and July, the sun will be in front of Gemini, the twins, and so on and so forth, due to that Earth's orbit. And so any of these constellations like Taurus, the bull, and Gemini, the twins, that the sun passes in front of, those are constellations of, um, that are called zodiacal constellations. So, okay, we can zoom in and we can see Pollux, the head of the brother Pollux and Castor, the head of the brother Castor, and their bodies come down this way. Now, it's kind of neat how this works. The next star in the vertex of the winter hexagon is Capella, and Capella is nearest to Castor. Notice how Castor begins with a C and Capella begins with a C, and Pollux is near Procyon, and so as you're looking for these um, stars that may help you to remember which one is which. Pollux near Procyon, Castor near Capella. These are all stars on the top part of the winter hexagon. So there's the top part of the winter hexagon and down here is the bottom part. Now Capella stands for the little lamb. That's how that name translates. And it is part of the Auriga, the charioteer constellation. There's Auriga holding on to the chariot reins. There's Capella, the little lamb, on his shoulder. So those are constellations to look for. They'll be, they'll be high in the sky in the wintertime, but even now in the month of April, you still will be able to catch a glimpse of them if you can get a good look at the western horizon not long after sunset. Now, if you turn your attention more towards the south, you can start to see additional constellations. Do you know what the next zodiacal constellation is after Gemini? There was Taurus, there was Gemini, and then there's one right in here. This is Cancer the Crab. 
And in cancer, the most beautiful thing to look for, and if you have binoculars, you'll love it, is the beehive star cluster. There's the beehive. It's an open cluster, not unlike the Pleiades and the Hyades. Open clusters typically have hundreds or up to thousands of stars in them. And the, ple um, the beehive cluster here is right there in the meat of Cancer the Crab. You can think about envisioning the crab as shown here. Usually the stars that you see in Cancer, it's one of the dimmer zodiacal constellations. You'll want to get to a dark region to see it, but you'll see this star, and you'll see this star, and you'll see this star, and you can kind of envision, um, I envision it as this being the body and a pincher arm coming this way and a pincher arm coming that way. Um, but you can envision it whichever way you like. There's no right way. The next constellation along the ecliptic is my cat's favorite constellation. It is Leo the Lion. So there you can see this backward question mark punctuated by Regulus. Regulus is right on the ecliptic. And then in the back end of Leo the Lion, you have this triangle to look for. And at the base of the triangle, the uh, left edge of the triangle, you have Denebola, the tail of the lion. And so there's Leo the lion that you can envision. Leo's a good constellation. It's pretty easy to spot. You just look for that backward question mark. And Denebola is quite bright, so you'll be able to see that back there as well. Okay, so after Cancer the Crab, we ha had Leo the lion. And if we work our way along, next we have Virgo the Virgin. So there we see Virgo in the south southeast. Uh, here we're starting to look towards the eastern horizon. And we're looking at the sky now as it appears in April off towards the east, mid-April. But this is still early in the evening. If we let time go by, um, we'll see things rise up from the east coming up and to the right. And so this is what the sky would look like around 918. This is from Meadville, but even if you're at another place, this will be a roughly the same time. It'll be a little different depending on whether you're on the western part or the eastern part of your particular time zone. But local time, this is what the sky would look like at around you know 920 or so um, in April. Now let's let some time go by. We'll let it go by here at an accelerated rate so that we can see the stars and other objects rising up and going up and to the right. And so that's how everything is going to move. They're going to arc across the sky as you're looking to the south. What's actually going on is things are making circles around the North Star. There's the uh, North Star um, right up here. Nope, I was pointing to the wrong one. There's the North Star right there. And notice how things are making circles around it. There's the Big Dipper. And I'm going to turn off the atmosphere, even though it's the daytime. I'm going to pretend it's nighttime so we can see the stars. The stars are up there in the daytime. It's just that the sun is so bright that the light from it scatters and in the Earth's atmosphere. And that prevents us from seeing the stars behind it. But I'm going to turn off the atmosphere with the help of Stellarium. And I'm going to therefore watch the stars as they circulate around Polaris, the North Star. But there it is, Polaris. As viewed from Meadville, Pennsylvania, it'll always be 42 degrees above the horizon, day and night. And that's because it's pointed to by the Earth's rotation axis. Uh, a lot of people think incorrectly that Polaris is special because it's a particularly bright star. It's not. It's not really that bright. Um, but what it's special, uh, what's special about it is that the Earth's rotation axis is pointing towards Polaris. Now, Polaris is part of the Little Dog constellation. Um, we could take a look at that here. And um, you can see the tail of the dog and the... Uh, I'm sorry. Now, Polaris is part of the Little Bear constellation. You can see the tail of the bear and the body of the bear. Right, And that's also known as the Little Dipper. The Little Dipper is actually um, fewer stars than the Little Bear constellation. But there's the cup of the Little Dipper and the handle of the Little Dipper. Here's the pointer stars pointing to Polaris. There's the handle of the Big Dipper and the cup of the Big Dipper. Um, and we've, we've let now um, over a day go by. 
right? We're all the way into April 18th at 11 in the morning. Um, the sun is still up in the sky, but we're watching how the stars would circulate. But now we can start to appreciate how stars come across the sky. They rise in the east and set in the west, not directly in the east and the west, um, unless you happen to look at just the right star. Okay, well, one thing to point out here is this star, and um, it's actually two stars. These are Alcor and Mizar. And I'll go ahead and I'll stop it here at around um, 9.27 p.m. as it turns out. And uh, I've got the atmosphere on. You can see there's a little bit of light pollution. Here's, here it is with the atmosphere off where you could see better. But with a little bit of light pollution, you're still able to get these stars to stand out. There's the handle and cup of the Big Dipper. Um, this is the star, actually stars, that I want to draw your attention to. For many years, people have been using this as a test of their visual acuity. These stars are Alcor and Mizar. And although even with the naked eye, that is without a telescope, you can see two stars there if you have good eyesight. Unfortunately, with my eyesight, I can really only see one star. It's a little bit too blurry, even when I'm wearing my glasses. But as you zoom in more and more, you find that there's more than two stars there. Here, for example, let's really zoom in on Mizar. And there you can see, whoa, under a telescopic view, and I'll have to pause it here because otherwise it'll drift off our field of view. Um, under a telescopic field of view, you can see there are multiple stars. Altogether, there are six stars in the Alcor Mizar system. Alcor and Mizar are just very loosely bound and orbiting around one another with a great distance between them. And then the other stars that make up each of them are more closely um, coupled to one another in this beautiful gravitational dance. So, um, okay, uh, remember that it is around 9.30 at night and uh, we see Arcturus on the horizon. We see Spica, which is in the Virgo, the Virgin constellation. Uh, and why don't we get back to talking about that a bit? One of the things you can do is you can find the handle of the Big Dipper and you arc to Arcturus, and then you're going to spike down to Spica. Spica is in the Virgo, the Virgin constellation. Now, I'm going to let a little more time go by so that um, these things get higher in the sky. And so let's go ahead and do that. We'll get this playing again. And so I've let enough time go by that now Arcturus and Spica are to the south. It's around 2.15 in the morning. And let's go ahead and zoom in on the Spica star, which is part of the constellation Virgo the Virgin. So at this point, the constellations have moved across the sky. They're arching from the east towards the west. We've caught Spica and Virgo when they're mostly directly to the south. And when you're looking for Virgo the Virgin, there's a two-step process that I use. I use the arc to Arcturus and then spike down to Spica. And once Spica is high enough in the sky, you'll be spiking down toward the horizon to do that. But in the early evening, when spike is low to the east, you might have to spike more horizontally. But there's the arcing to Arcturus and the spiking down to Spica. Now, Arcturus is in the Boötes the Herdsman constellation. And there you can see Bo Boötes. To many people, it kind of looks like a kite. There's the head of Boötes and the shoulders of Boötes. Here's his narrowing waistline. And there's his short little stubby legs right there. Now, Boötes also looks like a kite to many people. So there's the kite that I was talking about. It's a diamond-shaped kite right there with this side of the kite dented in a little bit. And you can even think about a little tail that's coming off the bottom of the kite. So you take the handle of the Big Dipper, arc to Arcturus, spike down to Spica. That's the first step in figuring out where the constellation um, Virgo the Virgin is. The second step to take into account is to find Leo the lion, because Leo is pretty easy to find. You look for that backward question mark punctuated by Regulus. You look for that triangle with Denebola being at the tail, and then you find Denebola, 
and then you just go over to the left and down a little bit. I'm going to assume that you're in the northern hemisphere, so you'll be facing the south, and as you face the south, you'll see Denebola. You go over, that is, um, more towards the east, and then down. And this oblong pattern of stars right there, that is the head of Virgo the Virgin. And you can imagine one of her arms coming up this way, another leg, a leg coming over here, another leg coming down here, and then one of uh, uh, Virgo's arms comes down to Spica. And so there's how you can find Virgo the Virgin. Now of all the zodiacal constellations, all 13 of them, if we include Ophiuchus, Virgo is the longest. It's the constellation that the sun spends the most time in front of over the course of a year. All right, so those are good constellations to look for. Cancer the Crab, Leo the Lion, Virgo the Virgin, Boades the Herdsman. Those are good ones to look for in the springtime, right? Because you don't have to stay up too late to see them. This is 2 o'clock right now, but you can start seeing them earlier in the evening as well, um, not long after sunset. And by the way, with each month that goes by, you'll see the same sky two hours earlier. So right now we have Arcturus um, pretty much directly to the south at 2.20 a.m. Uh, on April 19th. Let's imagine that we went ahead one month to May. When are you going to see what the same sky looks like? It's going to be two hours earlier. So we go to May, but then we'll see that sky not at 2.20 a.m., but at 12.20 a.m. There are Arcturuses. Or if we go ahead to June, we'll see it at 10.20 p.m., right? So you don't have to wait up as late to see these constellations as we go deeper and deeper into the springtime. Now, once we get into the summertime, then we can start to see those constellations quite easily of the summer triangle. And those will be the last few that I talk with you about now. And so we have it here in a summertime, July of 2020. But it will, of course, look other than positions of planets and so on. It'll look the same even in other years, 2021, 2022. Jupiter and Saturn will have moved on their orbits. And so it won't in other years uh, be they won't in other years be located at those same positions with respect to the background stars. But the stars will be in the same place. Given how far away they are, their proper motions are so slow, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference from one year to the next. But these are the stars of the summer triangle. Vega and Altair and Deneb. Vega is part of the Lyra the Harp constellation. You look for this little triangle right here and a squished rectangle. And at the bottom of the squished rectangle, if you can get a small telescope, you can look and you can look for the ring nebula, which is in between the two stars there. There it is. Let's zoom in on it. The ring nebula is a planetary nebula. A planetary nebula is what happens when a low or intermediate mass star dies, something less than eight times the mass of the sun in its final days. Uh, it will eject this planetary nebula. The gas from that will ex be expelled outward. And this planetary nebula will be visible, or would be visible if you could live that long, for tens of thousands of years as the gas spreads out over these large light year times, uh, uh, light year distance scale. At the center of the planetary nebula, what's left behind is the core of that star that died, a white dwarf. You'll have white dwarfs at the center of planetary nebulae. White dwarfs typically have roughly the mass of the sun, and they are about the size of the Earth. So that's something fun to know about the Lyra the Harp constellation, right? So we'll take a look at Lyra the Harp. There's the artwork for it. Vega is that nice bright star in Lyra the Harp. Now, if you go on to Altair, you know what constellation that's in? That's in Aquila the Eagle. There's the eagle. And when you're looking for it, what you want to do is look for this egg-shaped pattern of stars. And then some of these other stars are the tail feathers and other wings and so forth of Aquila the Eagle. But Altair will be one of these stars in this egg-shaped pattern. And then finally, 
we have Deneb, the tail of the swan. Remember, Denebola was the tail of the lion. Deneb is the tail of the swan. This is Alberio over here. That's the head of the swan. And the swan is flying right along the Milky Way galaxy. And so you'll see, if you're in a dark enough region, this dim band of light across the sky. And if you aren't sure, what you could do is you could look for Cygnus the swan, and that'll help you to identify that band of light. It looks like this wispy little cloud if you're lucky enough to be in a dark enough region to see it. And uh, that is the Milky Way galaxy, the collective light of billions of stars in our arm of the Milky Way is what you're seeing there. You can see when I zoom in on the Milky Way, there's just lots and lots of stars. That's what that glow is, the collective light of all those stars. It turns out that roughly halfway between Deneb and Alberio, um, there's um, a black hole, Cygnus X1. The X in Cygnus X1 stands for X-ray. It is an X-ray source. That 20 solar mass black hole is accreting matter from a companion. That mass falls down onto an accretion disk, which is very hot, and that's why it emits in the X-ray. And by analyzing those X-rays, we can tell that there's a black hole there that the accretion disk is orbiting around, a black hole with a mass 20 times the mass of our sun. All right, so that is all that we're going to show you here today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the tour of the night sky, and uh, stay safe and take care.